Going back quite a few years, um, my daughter Paige is now a senior in college. When she was still in high school, there was a really bad snow. I know we, have, we don't know what that's like in Ohio anymore. There was a really bad snow, and uh, there, the kids had a snow day, and I had to take her to the doctor. I think it was a follow-up visit to, after having her wisdom teeth removed. And so we were driving my big Tundra pickup truck, and I love driving that in the bad weather when it's real slippery and, and, and ice on the roads and stuff because I could put it in four-wheel drive, and it felt like you're invincible, right? So I'm driving Paige to this follow-up appointment, and I decided to take it upon myself to make it a teaching time to talk to her about driving in the, in the bad weather conditions and, and snowy and slippery conditions. And it was real slow going, but I left early enough. I knew it was going to be. And so I was just pointing out to her all the mistakes everybody was making. And as we got further and further along, we were going down 22 and 3, and there was a big line of cars, and I could see a car in the front was going really slow. And so the Tundra sits up high, and I'm pointing out to Paige, see, that person's not driving well. In the, in the snow, people, and I started saying things like, people in Ohio don't even know how to drive in the snow. It's ridiculous. You know, these people are crazy. They don't know what they're doing. It's, it's horrible. You know, it just makes it a lot worse. And so I was going through all that. Took her to the doctor, fine, brought her home, and then I had to run some errands for church. So I get back out on the same roads. I'm cruising down 22 and 3, same roads, still same crazy people. And as I'm driving down 22 and 3, getting about to the Landon Kroger down there where there's like, three or four lanes of road, I looked down for a second doing something. When I looked up, the cars in front of me had all completely stopped. So I hit my brakes real quick, and my truck spins sideways. And I'm sliding this way, and I see cars coming. And I start thinking, I'm about to get in a wreck with like four cars at one time because my truck was big. I'm sliding sideways. And I turn into it and hit the brakes a little bit, and the, the truck spins around, facing the right direction, in exactly the right place like it should be behind the car and stopped probably this close to the car. And my adrenaline's pumping. I'm just like, and I just sat there for a minute, and I'm like, I really don't know what I'm doing either. You know, that kind of thing. I don't know how to drive in the snow after all either. And as I thought about that, I thought, there's so many areas in our life where we think we've got it figured out, but there's still room for improvement. There's still room for us to learn and grow. We're in the middle of this series, Loving. We started off week one looking at loving God. Last week we looked at loving your spouse, and today we're going to look at loving your family. But I just, I had this thought. If I were to ask you right now to raise your hand if you love your family, all of you would raise your hand because it's politically correct to do. In fact, if somebody walked up to you and said, hey, do you love your family? And you're like, uh, not really. That would, people would look at you like you're a crazy loon, right? We always say we love our family, but just like me driving in the snow, there's room for improvement. If your family dynamic is awesome today, it can get better. If your family dynamic is struggling today, it can get better. As we look at God's word today, my hope and my prayer is that you'll open your mind and open your heart to receive the truth of God's word as it pertains to our families. Let's pray together as we continue worshiping. Father God, thank you so much for the blessing of being in your house. Lord, this opportunity right now to open your word your love letter to us. Father, I pray that you would help us to take the truth found in it and apply it to our lives. Father, I pray that today you would speak to our hearts about this thing of family, that you would help us to understand how incredibly, uh, what an incredible gift it is and how incredibly blessed we are to be part of a family. But Lord, that it's also hard work. Thank you for loving us. May you be honored and glorified now as we, your people, study your word. We pray all this in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to begin with verse 1, but I want to point out something. If you were here last Sunday, we were looking at loving your spouse, and we were actually in Ephesians 5, beginning with verse 22. In fact, what we're reading here is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, and he's giving us what's part of known as the marriage law, okay? So as we look in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, and, and when we look later in Colossians, you'll see some themes to what we looked at last week as well. Ephesians chapter 6, begin at verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training of and instruction of the Lord. Now, again, as we 
kick these verses off, and it starts off, children, obey your parents, honor your parents. This is one of those moments where as parents, we're, we're wanting to, you know, kind of wrap our kids on the head a little bit and say, hey, pay attention. You know, right here, this is important, right? And it is. God's Word does tell us that, that we should obey our parents, that we should honor our father and our mother. And there's some, some strong reasons for that. In fact, let me just, just say this. There is a, a law, if you will, at play in human nature that children always love their parents, even if they're lousy parents. Even if a parent is abusive and does horrific things to a, a child, that, that child still loves its parent. It does. I've seen it played out over and over. My wife's actually a counselor in the school system, and she's seen it played out over and over where child protective services are removing a child from a home, and the, the kid is screaming and crying, wanting to stay with an abusive parent because they love their parent. There's a part of us that's always going to be attached and bonded to our parent. One of the reasons that God's Word tells us we should obey them is because God knows that we're always going to be attached to them. And if we disobey them, that dynamic in the family begins to break and erode. That's important for us to note. But the other side of this is it's not just children obey your parents and honor and, um, um, and honor your father and mother. But look at verse 4 again. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Now, just a quick little question for all of us. When was the last time you used the word exasperate in a sentence? And if you write any emails this week with exasperate in it, that's a strange word, isn't it? We don't use it a lot. So I want to share with you the, the definition. That word exasperate means to irritate intensely. Irritate intensely. Look at that verse again. Fathers, do not irritate intensely your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. See, God's Word is telling us, it's reminding children, you better obey your parents. Honor your father and mother that you may go, you live a long life. But then fathers, don't intensely irritate your children. Now, moms, you're not off the hook. When it says fathers, it really could read parents. The Apostle Paul addressed it to fathers because the, it was normal to address the, the man of the house in all communication like that. So what this verse is saying is that parents, we shouldn't intensely irritate. We shouldn't exasperate our children. You see, here's what the, the caution is here. We're supposed to bring our kids up in the instruction of the Lord. God's Word is clear. Kids are supposed to obey us and honor us as parents. It's clear. But if we're not careful, we'll begin to give instruction as parents do and need to at, at times. But we'll begin to pick through them and irritate them at every turn. Let me, let me paint a picture for you. Sometimes as parents, you'll give instruction. You might, some parents might have long lists of chores. Some may have short lists of chores. Whatever the case may be, it's good for kids to work. Nothing wrong with that. But if you're not careful, you'll, you'll come home and be like a drill sergeant inspecting what they were expected to do. You'll pour through their homework. You'll go watch their sporting events. And after everything that they do, you pick them apart. You're constantly critiquing. You didn't do that right. You didn't do that right. Why didn't you clean your room better? Why didn't you get a better grade on that test? Why didn't you? And before you know it, you are intensely irritating your child. When they come near you, it's not pleasurable. It's not exciting. They don't, show, they don't show up in your presence and be like, man, I love being with mom and dad. Instead, they're guarded. They're intensely irritated because they think you're about to begin to pick them apart again. That's a dynamic that's very easy to start to slip into. Make no mistake, as parents, we need to give instruction. But it needs to be balanced with love, as we'll look at here in just a little bit. We need to, to share insight and wisdom that we've gained. But it needs to be balanced. It's important that we understand that. Go ahead and turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. Let's look at a few more verses on this thing of family. Colossians 3, begin at verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as, as fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. 
Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. So let's look again. These are these, these rules for, for Christian households, people that follow the, the Lord himself. You'll see that it starts off, again, very familiar, sounds a lot like Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. But then you find, as we looked at last week, it's not just, you know, the wives are submitting. There's actually a greater mandate even on the husbands to sacrifice and love the wife as Christ loved the church. So here in, in Colossians 3, verse 19, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, what's interesting, let's just stop here for a second. We're not talking about loving your spouse, but I, I want to hover on it for just a moment. When the wife submits and the husband loves and sacrifices, as Christ says to the church, the marriage relationship, as I said last week, there's some synergy that happens, and it begins to grow to something much greater than you could ever imagine. When that happens, that influences every relationship in the family, every single one. From the youngest child to the oldest, it influences all of it. It's crucial. It's critical. You want your family dynamic to be healthy and happy, you better love your spouse passionately. You better be willing to submit. You better be willing to love sacrificially. When you do that, it grows, and that influence hits everybody. But notice that God's Word doesn't stop there. Wives submit, husbands love, and we go back to children obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now, we just saw in Ephesians 6 that we're to bring our children up in the instruction of the Lord. Let me stop for just a second here before we go any further. As parents, we need to be giving instruction to our children about life and, and about everything from, from, you know, what it's like to be a young person all the way to being an adult. One of the other reasons why children should be willing to obey and listen to their parents is, let's face it, I'm 47 years old, I've lived a lot of life, I've got more wisdom than I had when I was 16 years old. I've lived more. I've had more mistakes. I've had more crazy things happen, right? What happens, just like everyone else, and I'm not trying to insult our young people now, but a lot of times, young people, not a lot of times, every time, they think they know everything. And they know less than 1% of what they really need for life. But they'll argue that point till they're blue in the face. Why you're wrong, why this should happen, why I shouldn't have that curfew, why I shouldn't. And the reason is that they should listen to us is because as parents and grandparents, we've lived more life. We've experienced things. We've got some wisdom. And what we're trying to do is help them avoid some of the pain and mistakes that we've made. And if they're smart, they'll listen to us. They'll obey us. It'll bless the relationship together, but it'll save them some pain and anguish as well. But here's the other side of this obey. As parents, the instruction that we're giving them should be good instruction. We should, in fact, be instructing. God's Word tells us that we are to, to, to teach them and instruct them in the Word of the Lord. So we should be modeling what it's like to be a Christ follower, but we should also be challenging them on what it's like to be a Christ follower and expecting them to hold some certain standards. Let me tell you a big mistake I see today. I see a lot of parents that say this kind of stuff, and I've met with many. They'll say things like, you know what, I don't ever force my kids to go to church because I was forced, and, and I don't want them to turn bitter towards the Lord. And they'll say things, so I let them decide. Let me, let me just tell you something. That's complete lunacy. That is complete lunacy. As parents, we force our kids to do things that are important for them. We force them to go to school. We force them to go to the doctor. We force them to get shots that they hate. Any of your kids hate getting shots? I'm like the worst because I always joke. Like before we went to Amazon last year, I kept telling Hannah that the, the um, yellow fever shot is one they're going to give you in the eyeball. You know, I'm like messing around. And, and she knew me well enough to just be like, Dad, just stop, whatever, you know. But she was nervous about them. But think about this. As parents, we force our kids to do things that are important. We force them to be committed to sports teams. You're, gonna, you're not missing practice. You're going to practice. You're going you're gonna to give it your all out there. That's what you do. We, we force them to stay committed to, to extracurricular activities. We force them to do all of this. And then so many times when it comes to church, it's up to you. That's sending a message that that's not important. And we find from God's word that they're to obey us. So we should be giving them sound instruction. Let me tell you something. As parents, you should mandate that your kids come to church. Absolutely. You should mandate that they come to everything that's offered for them. You should do that. They're not going to be embittered towards the Lord unless they see in you hypocrisy. When a child starts to see hypocrisy, 
That's what burns them out on the Lord completely. I'm just telling you right now. When they see consistency, when you have standards for them, they will obey them and the Lord will move and work through them in ways that you can't even imagine. But if they're not in a position to even have the Lord speak to them and challenge them, they're going to miss out on a whole world of spiritual development. So that's the the thought here as, as we continue looking at children obey your parents. But notice these verses that we just read. It talks about slaves. That's part of the household law, too, because in the writing of this letter to the church, at the, the Colossians, it was, it was this, this situation where slaves were common, and slaves were part of the household. So slaves should serve and, and work is, is onto the Lord. But look at this verse in verse 23. This is a verse that we've all heard before. I read it earlier. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Now, we've seen this on motivational posters. We've used this, many of us have used this verse many times for employment and for all kinds of things, not just employment, but but also uh, being a part of a sports team or an extracurricular thing. Do all things is onto the Lord, right? Did you ever know that that was being taken out of context? That's not the context for it. The context is not to be the best employer. We should do that. No question, we should do that. But the context is in the family. When was the last time you got up and thought from the perspective of this verse 23 about your family? When was the last time you thought about your family that you should work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for men? What this is saying is give it your all. Again, as I've said before, the priority of relationships, your your relationship with the Lord, your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your family. And what we find in verse 23 is we should do this with all of our heart. We should do it with all that we are. This is important. This is important that we understand because what's at stake is our family dynamic. And understand this for a second. Your family dynamic goes on your entire life. It's not just why you live at home. In fact, let me share this this quote. I love this quote by William Timmelson. You don't really understand human nature unless you know why a child on a merry-go-round will wave every time around at their parents and the parents will wave back. Let me read it one more time. You don't really understand human nature unless you know why a child on a merry-go-round will wave every time around at their parents, and the parents will wave back. I said earlier that children love their parents, even if they're horrible, lousy parents. You're always going to be bonded, loving your parents, looking for their approval. I'm 47 years old. I'm getting old. And do you know that it is music to my ears to hear my dad say that he's proud of me? Do you know what that is? That's me at 47 going around the merry-go-round looking for my dad. That's me. I'm looking for him. And I want to know that he's looking for me too. So when he says stuff like that, man, it just it, it moves a part of me. And I'm 47, a father of my, of, I'm a father as well. You see, what happens is what I want you to understand is this family dynamic goes on your entire life. You're always going to be on that merry-go-round looking for your parents. Parents, no pressure, but your kids are always going to be looking for you. And here's the crazy thing. When you get well up in your years, the roles are going to reverse. You're going to be on that merry-go-round looking for them. You better establish your family dynamic right now. You better make it a priority. You better work at it as, as onto the Lord himself. You better make sure that this incredible blessing of family that God's given you is top priority for you. That you're not just going through the motions, that you're not allowing family dynamics that are unhealthy to begin to play out. You've got to make it a priority. You've got to make it a priority. So what are the keys to a healthy, happy family? First, attitude. Attitude. Let me share with you Psalm 127. The scripture records, begin at verse 1, Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Sons are a heritage from the Lord, children a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. Let me read verse 3 and following again. Sons, which also means daughters, are a heritage from the Lord, children a reward from Him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. 
Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. Question for your parents, grandparents. When you look at your kids, your grandkids, do you have an attitude of blessing? Do you recognize that they are a blessing from God? Because here's the thing. Parenting is hard. Parenting is hard. We've, I, I, I really think we've got a great family. Mary and I love our kids. We have a great relationship. We talk a lot. But let me be, be crystal clear for a second. There have been times in our, in our life and in our interaction with them where it's like you almost just want to take your hands off the wheel. You're like, this is too hard. Enough. I don't want to deal with this stress anymore. I don't want to deal with that where you want to take your hands off. And we've seen that played out, that parenting style. Every single one of us in the room have seen that parenting style before where parents just take their hands off the wheel. There's no curfew. There's nothing. The kids figure stuff out on their own. They just back away. Parenting is hard. We need to remind ourselves when it gets hard that we should have an attitude of blessing. You see, this also goes with that word exasperate, to, to irritate intensely. If we're not careful, all we start to do is notice all the flaws in our kids. And because they're human just like us, there's plenty of them. There's plenty of them. You look at anybody long enough and you're going to find flaws. Look at anybody. Look at the people next to you right now. Point out their flaws. No, don't do that. I'm just kidding. You're going to find flaws, right? Be careful that you don't start to let that attitude be the dominant one in your family. Otherwise, you will truly irritate intensely your children, and they will be absolutely discouraged. What is your attitude with your family? I love this quote by Carol Botchner. They may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. They may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. You see, even as a parent when you're given instruction, even as a parent when you're interacting in a tense, rough time, you have an opportunity there to extend love, to have an attitude of this is a child, this is a blessing of mine. And your kids will pick up on that. They absolutely will. Second key to a healthy, happy family. Not only is it attitude, but it's actions. It's actions. Let me, let me be clear again. This goes a lot with, with what we were talking about last week with loving your spouse. It's not just words. You don't just say, I love you to your kids. You better have some actions to back it up, like some real actions. And I'm not talking actions of, I put a roof over your head, I put food on the table. No, that's your responsibility as a parent. I'm talking loving actions, some actions that back up how you care about them, some actions that back up your attitude of feeling blessed. A few years back, we talked to our kids about you know, favorite memories growing up and, and just, we were having just a, a random conversation. And what was funny is our kids started talking about growing up, one of their favorite things was we used to do um, sock ball dodgeball in the house. You know, when you put your socks in a drawer, you just put them in a ball. If you're a folder, you have OCD and issues. If you just put them in the ball, you throw them in a the drawer, right? They're perfect dodgeballs. They don't break anything. So in our master bedroom, we had a, a pretty big master bedroom. We put like t-shirts, a little line. We'd put the balls there. Man, we would go at it and be sweating and just having a blast. They absolutely loved it. They loved it. Here's another thing. My daughter Paige, I told you earlier, she's a senior in college. When she was going into, I think, first grade, it may have even been second grade. This is how bad this was. She was writing the days of the week on the calendar, Monday, Tuesday, right? And she wrote Friday, and then for Saturday, she called it Cartoon Day. She didn't know it was called Saturday. We didn't have cell phones back then. We didn't have cable TV. That was broadcast TV. That was when the cartoons came on. Saturday at our house, it was bring your favorite pillows down. We all laid in the floor. Mary made cinnamon rolls, brought it over, and for a couple hours, we just watched cartoons. It was cartoon day, and the kids loved it. They, they took turns on who got to lay on top of me, and it was, just, it was just fun for years so much that she called it cartoon day. Bath time. Bath time, our kids, Mary and I, we were always just having fun with them, right? So bath time, we would bring a TV and a VCR and set it right up on the edge where they could get electrocuted. I'm just kidding. We didn't do that. It was back a couple of feet, right? But they'd come in. Sometimes they would watch movies. You know, we would play things. I even got these little color beads. You may have seen them, maybe not, where you could, like, like as you run the bath, you're like, say to the kids, hey, what color you want? Red? Bloop. Throw that baby in there, and the water turns red, and it doesn't stain anything. Blue? Bloop. They were awesome. They were so awesome, I used to use them. I'm just kidding. I didn't use them. 
But it's just that kind of thing that, you know, these actions that, that back up, man, you are, a, you are a prize to me. You are a, it matches with the attitude. You're a blessing to me, and I'm going to make the most of this. Yes, we got to get back, but it can be fun. Yes, we're going to have Saturday morning. Maybe we got to do yard work, but we're making a priority right now to make some memories. It's huge that you take these opportunities. And what's crazy is when your kids are younger, you interact with them with actions a certain way. But let me just tell you, my kids now, they're older. If Paige came home from school, I'm like, hey, let's go do some bath beads. or That would be creepy, right? That's not right at all, right? But, but your, your actions change. They change, and you demonstrate love in a different way. Let me give you an example. My daughter Hannah is on the track team, and she started last year as a sophomore throwing shot and disc. This year, she really wants to do well. She's wanting to, to be the best she can be. So my wife, Mary, spent hours researching and finding a national collegiate champion, um, shot and disc throw champion, a, a national champion, and, and trainer, athlete of the year, Division II, all this kind of stuff. And then I had the opportunity to take her to these sessions with her on Friday in Indianapolis. Now, what's interesting, yeah, it wasn't sock dodgeball, it wasn't anything like that, but these were actions that demonstrate we love you, we care about you. And it's not just with shot and disc, it's with conversations about the Lord, instruction, giving her things that are important to, to instruct her on so that she has an opportunity to obey something that will change her life. You see, these things are so important, our attitude and our actions. But the keys to a, a, a healthy and happy family dynamic aren't just attitude and actions, they're also affirmation with our words and appropriate touch. These things are huge. Because again, if you're not careful as parents, your conversation with your kids turns into, do this, do this, do this, why didn't you do this, where's that? Instead of just spending some time and just talking with them, giving them a hug, giving them uh, you know, a kiss on the cheek. Let me tell you something, kids are never too old to get that. Never too old to get that. In fact, our kids are, are in college. My son Luke's a freshman at, at Alabama, too. And I'll tell you, it's every time we get together as a family, when we say goodbye, it is gut-wrenching. It hurts. And I'm going to be honest with you. I get emotional sometimes, even now. Even my daughter Paige, she's a full adult graduating this year. When I have to say bye to her, it hurts. And I give her a hug. I give her a kiss. I tell her how much I care about her. I do the same thing for my son Luke. I give him a hug, give, rub his head, give him a kiss on the cheek, and, and that kind of thing. Let me tell you something. There's, there, don't, don't try to pull the macho card because my son Luke is on the merry-go-round. He's looking for us every time it goes around. And I'm going to be there for him every day of his life. You want your family dynamic to be something special? You commit to that too. That's what I'm talking about. There's a commercial out there that drives me absolutely insane. I don't even know what product it is, but the dad's dropping this kid off at college. It's a, it's a dad and his son that's 18 or whatever, and it's like they stand there for a minute, and they're trying to figure out, am I going to give you a handshake? Am I gonna? Let me tell you something. If your family dynamic is when you part ways in a moment like that, you're not sure, handshake, hug, whatever, you've got some work to do. You've got some work to do. You need to open the floodgates. You need to have an attitude of being blessed by your kids. Grandparents, you're not exempt. You need to have an attitude of, of recognizing that your grandkids are a blessing. Hear me on this. Grandparents, you can have a profound influence on your grandkids if you choose to do it. But many grandparents choose not to. They stay at, at arm's length and they show up at, at just special times of the year, holidays. If you have the opportunity to be involved in your grandkids' life and you don't take it, shame on you. Because you're missing out on an incredible blessing. Incredible blessing. See, these keys to a happy, healthy family, attitude, actions, affirmation, make the most of it. Make sure they know that you care about them. Make sure there's appropriate touch going on all the time, all the time. That's a, that's a critical, critical component. And if you get these three things correct, attitude, actions, and affirmation, you're going to get number four. It'll naturally come. And that's this thing of atmosphere, the culture. What I'm talking about is this safe zone. I tell my family all the time, our house is our castle. It's the safe zone. Nobody will come against you here. Nobody will hurt your feelings. This is a place where you are protected and you are safe. The amazing thing is that when you get the attitude, actions, and affirmation right, that atmosphere, that culture will go wherever your family goes. If it's at a sporting event, if it's on vacation, It'll be a situation that when your kids, when you haven't seen them for a while, when they come back into that atmosphere, they're going to breathe a sigh of relief knowing that they're safe now. Nothing will come against them. They don't have to be on guard. Question for you. 
How do your kids feel when they're in your presence? Does it feel like a safe zone? Is the atmosphere solid? Is it something that they love to be there, or are they on pins and needles? If they're on pins and needles, you may need to go back and take a look at attitude, actions, and affirmation. You may need to go back and look at, at submit your wife submitting to your husband, husband loving your wife. You may need to go back and recognize that maybe you're not giving good instruction for them to obey. You may need to go back and maybe your, your family dynamic's not grounded on God's word. You're just going through the motions. And as a result, it's flimsy. It doesn't feel solid. It makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference in the world. Let me close with this. My son Luke, a couple weeks ago, did something, well, probably a week ago, that I didn't know about. I started hearing about it from my daughter's page in Hannah. He was in a class. The reason I share this with you is this, this atmosphere, this safe zone, when you get the attitude, actions, and affirmation right, when husband and wife are loving each other and it begins to impact everybody, it changes the dynamic between siblings as well. It changes. That, that safe zone begins to extend out. It changes everything. So my son Luke was at a college class down in Alabama, and, and one of the things that was brought up was something about this, this um, there, some case study they were looking at where a, a sibling needed a kidney transplant, and there were three other brothers and sisters that were a match that refused to give a kidney for him. Wouldn't do it. And the discussion in the class erupted, and all the people in the class, the general consensus was, yeah, I wouldn't either. I wouldn't do that either. Now, you might sound like, think, well, that's crazy. That's shocking. It was, it was the majority of the class was feeling that way. Out of that, Luke was so stirred that he sent a text to Paige and Hannah, an emotional text. And he said, I love you guys so much. If I had to give my heart, I would give it for you. That's the atmosphere. That's the culture that you're looking for. That's what comes when parents begin to make sure they have their attitude, kids are a blessing. Their actions back it up at all ages, at all stages. Words of affirmation are used on a regular basis. I love you, appropriate touch. And as a result, that atmosphere is established and it's a safe zone. What's your family dynamic like? If you had to rate your family dynamic on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being awesome, where are you? Because here's the beautiful thing. God never leaves us right where we are. If your family dynamic is lacking, if you're a parent and you're sitting there and you're thinking, man, that word exasperate, that completely describes my relationship with my kids. If you're here as a parent and you're thinking, you know, Ron, when you were talking about uh, making my kids come to church, man, I'm not doing that and I'm convicted by that. Here's the beautiful thing. Wherever you are, you can start right there and change it. You can start right there and change it. I promise you, it'll become as natural as breathing in and out. You'll have, a, you'll have a great family. It won't be perfect. My family's not perfect either. Not one of us is because we're human. We're all dirtbags, every single one of us. But I promise you, your family dynamic can be one that you want to raise your hand and say yes. Your family dynamic will be one that when, when you're in your home and everybody's there, you say there's no greater place on earth. That you'll talk about deep things, trivial things. You'll talk about your faith. You'll talk about what God's speaking to you about. You'll talk about sports and everything in between. But it constantly goes back to God and what God's doing in and through your life. That can be. Or not. Or you can say, Ron, those were some great words you shared today. But no thank you. I'm going to walk out of here just as I came in. See, that's a crazy thing with free will. You can say yes, you can say no. In just a second, I'm going to pray. We're going to have some deacons up here at the front. My hope and my prayer is that whatever God speaks to your heart about, you'll say yes. You just need to pray. Come to the front. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, step out. Come talk with these deacons. They would love to share with you how you can be changed forever from the inside out through what Jesus did on the cross for you and for me. Let's pray together as so our deacons come now. Father God, thank you so much for the blessing of being in your house. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to study your word and to, to look at this instruction on family dynamics. And Lord, we praise you and we thank you for the gift of family. 
Lord, we praise you and we thank you for the gift of marriage. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for the extreme blessing that it is to be a parent. Lord, I pray right now that you would give every single one of us in this room, regardless of the role that we have in the family. Lord, for the, the kids, Lord, I pray that you give them the, the desire to serve you and to, to be obedient to whatever their parents ask them. Lord, for parents, may we make a decision that we're going to be the best parents that we can be no matter what, and that we're going to give worthy instruction for our kids to follow. But Lord, I pray that each family would make a decision that their attitude would be a positive one, that they were blessed, that their actions would back that up, that there would be affirmation, positive touch and words, and that, Lord, there would be atmosphere that is established, that is a safe zone where, where young people and, and old alike can thrive. Lord, you are amazing. And I pray right now that during this invitation time that you'd be honored and glorified as we, your people, are obedient. We pray all this in your Son, Jesus' name.